everybody's finding their seat, I'm going to go through the announcements. There are some significant announcements that need to be added to the announcement list. First of all, doesn't it smell nice in here? It smells like new carpet. So we don't, we're not going to be allowing people to bring coffee, tea, or any kind of dark liquid into the auditorium anymore. There are several significant and large coffee stains on the floor, so we're going to try to protect it, and uh, so be careful with things. Also, uh, next Tuesday night, everybody out there in Wi-Fi country paying attention, we will not have Bible class. There will be no live streaming. We will be at the pre-trib conference in Dallas, and so as usual... No Bible class on pre-trib week. I'll be back Wednesday, and we will have class on Thursday night. But that's not the only schedule change. We will not have Thursday night Bible class on December the 23rd, because on Friday night, December the 24th, Christmas Eve, we will be having our Christmas Eve communion service. And then on December 12th, which is in about 12 days, on Sunday we will have our annual Thanksgiving Christmas dinner after church on that Sunday. There are sign-up she- seat- <laughs> sign sheets for sides and desserts, and we also need help cleaning up every year afterwards, so that's an important way that you can help out at that dinner. The other thing that will happen on the 12th, for those of you who are, who are even mildly considering going to Israel, as far as I'm concerned, we're going. Lindy, our travel agent, will be here actually in Houston and at church that December 12th. If you're interested in going at all and have any questions about all of the stuff related to travel and everything, you should make it a point to be here because we'll have a little opportunity to talk to her and find out what the answers to all of our questions are, some of which we just don't know. But that will be on that particular uh, that particular Sunday. And speaking of the Israel trip, the dates are June 5th to 17th. And if you're even mildly thinking about going... You better start getting your passports in order now because there's such a backlog that it's taking four or five months or six months to get your passport. So please do not waste time. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go straight to the uh, post office and get the information you need to get a passport. That is extremely, uh, extremely important. So that, I think, takes care of our announcements. So it is good to be back in regular schedule this week after <clears throat> having a bout with uh, bronchitis the last couple of weeks and having to cancel everything. But God is faithful, and I'm back, and I'm feeling about 98%. Tomorrow will be 99%. By Thursday, I'm hoping it's 105%. All right, we got a lot to do in the next month. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. In God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Before we begin, let's have a few moments of silent prayer so we can make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, again, we come together here to just be refreshed by our study of your word, thinking through what has been revealed to us, coming to grips with our Uh, understanding of Scripture and all of this at many levels, but always reminding us that you are faithful, that you are the one who sustains us, you are the one who delivers us in and through our trials, 
And Father, you are the one who takes care of us and watches over us at all times. And we must always be reminded as we think things through with this song, this song in Judges 5 that the battle is the Lord's. The battle is yours. And we need to walk by the Holy Spirit and we need to trust in you. Do that which is our responsibility but not take on responsibility through worry and anxiety and trying to take and wrest control away from you. We are to trust in you. So, Father, we pray that we might take that lesson to heart, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to Judges 5. Judges 5, and tonight, Lord willing, we will complete this song. Now, you may not be going home until 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock. I'm just, just kidding. I feel like a broken record after standing up and teaching through Psalm 68 on uh, Sunday, again, we look at a psalm that it, a song, also a psalm, but a song that is difficult to translate. And the, one of the reasons with this song is it's written very early in the history of Israel, and it uses some uh, archaic words and archaic grammatical structures. And it just drives translators bonkers trying to work their way through some of these things. And you can tell because of some of the ways they, you can tell, well, you just guessed at that. And it's an educated academic guess based on context, but that's, that's what happens sometimes. Not every verse in the Bible is easily translated because of different factors. We know what the text says. We just don't always have a clear enough understanding of some of these words, in, especially in Hebrew, that are only used one or two times in the Old Testament. And to make matters worse, words that are used in a poetic context have a different range of meaning than words that are used in a legal context or when you're just telling a simple story. So it becomes rather challenging at times. We talked about it a little last time, and we'll talk about some of these things a little more as we go through here uh, this evening. But it is all about how God brings victory. It's very simple, no matter what the details may be, a what details may be a little fuzzy. God, the focal point is praising God because he has delivered Israel from this Canaanite oppression and the focus is to call the people together to praise God and to join in an exuberant celebration of the victory that God has given them over their enemy. But even in the midst of that, a very positive, positive focus on the song, within the song we are reminded that all is not well in Israel that they still have a problem. There's division. Some of the tribes were either not at all enthusiastic about joining in the victory. Uh, some didn't play a part at all because they weren't unified. You had a tremendous amount of disunity coming about because of the moral and spiritual apostasy and the rebellion against God. And remember the basic problem as it was laid out when we look at the opening uh, section in 1, 1, to 3, 6 was that they had abandoned God and they had turned to the Baals and the Asherah, to the false gods. And we went through all the passages in Deuteronomy and elsewhere that indicated that they may be worshiping an idol of wood or stone or metal, but behind that God, not physically behind that, that God or that idol, but that there was a power behind those false gods that was demonic. And so when you look at a lot of scripture, what you see is a polemic. Polemic is an argument against something. Putting down your opponent. And God is doing that in the way that he demonstrates his power over the 
forces of nature over the wind, over the storm. Remember, Baal was the storm god, the wind god, the god of lightning, all of these things. And so these northern Canaanites are worshiping uh, the Baals and worshiping the Asherah. And yet, how does God give victory to the Israelites? Well, he gets their chariot corps out in the middle of the flat plain in the valley of Esdralon, and then gets a, sends a, an incredible storm because Yahweh is the God of the storms, not Baal. And it will rain so fast and so hard that it creates a flash flood and turns the ground to muck and the chariot corps gets stuck in the mud. And that's what enables the Israelites to defeat him. God's in control of the elements. God's in control of everything. It's not global warming. I know you know that, but you just have to remind a few people who may be new. Man does not control the environment and can't, and all of his attempts to do so are probably, I would guess, 99.9% .9 of the things they attempt are going to just make things worse at best. So that's what we see as we see this structure of, of this, this book, the introduction and then the description of what happens in each of these uh, discipline cycles that takes place. And each time God raises up a judge, a deliverer, and as a result of that, they have peace or rest in the land. That's the last thing we read in the verse, I mean in the chapter, is that the land had rest for 40 years years after this uh, Jewish generation. Okay, so here's an outline. I didn't have all of this up last time, so this is new. The introduction is in the first verse, which simply sets the stage. And then there's a call to praise Yahweh uh, because of his deliverance in verses 2 and 3. And then there's a reminder of God's prior acts of deliverance in the history of Israel, going back to Mount Sinai after the giving of the law. Of the law. And then there is a reminder of the bad times and that God raises up Deborah uh, in order to bring uh, deliverance. And she is called a prophetess as well as one who judged Israel. But those things fit together. But she doesn't really play any major part in the battle other than being the uh, spokesperson for God calling the nation to battle against the Canaanites. There's a call then for praise for Yahweh's righteous acts in the nation and for the people to come forth to do battle. And then there's the response of the tribes in verses 11d. That last line is really the sort of the summary, the topical sentence for what comes in the next six verses. Then there is a description of God's defeat of the Canaanites, which brings into focus, and I think this is just the high point of the whole song, it brings into focus that the, not only are the forces of creation involved in the battle, but the angelic hosts are involved in the battle. So it shows that at times in history, we don't know whether it's every time or some of the time, but at times in history, the angels are involved in battles in the, in the heavenlies. There's an invisible war between the forces of the angelic forces that serve God and those that serve Satan. Then there is a praise for Yael, who is called blessed of women. And then uh, there's an expression of sorrow for Sisera's mother, because Sisera is not coming home. And then a concluding wish. And then finally, a statement of rest in the land. So that's our structure. So since it's been a couple of weeks because I was uh, ill last week, we're just going to review some things very rapidly until we get down to where we were the last time. And we cut it short the last time because if you remember, uh, we had a, a guest speaker, Paul Scharf was here with uh, Friends of Israel. Okay. So this is a declarative or descriptive praise psalm. It's describing what God has done, really. It's thanksgiving. And you have these 
Uh, this is one of the standard ways in which the psalms are structured. Also, you have lament psalms and communal praise psalms and a couple of other patterns. And Psalm 50, verse 14 says, Offer to God thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, I think having a, an attitude, I hate using this phrase, attitude of gratitude, thinking in terms of gratitude toward God with reference to everything that comes our way, because many times we think things don't go real well for us and we get a little upset about the change in our plans. But God is doing something and often we get a chance to recognize, well, the way things worked out was probably better. And we need to be grateful for things even when we think they're not so, so much in our favor. And that is an expression of the grace orientation of our soul. A person who is not grateful for everything is a person who is not grace-oriented. They are too self-centered to be grace-oriented. And that describes most of our culture because we live in the I, me, my generation where everything centers around each individual purpose, uh, each individual person. Uh, Hebrews 13, 15 says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Giving thanks to God is called by the Holy Spirit a sacrifice of praise. Some people get the idea that sacrifice always has something that, that we're going to hurt because we do it. And we're going to feel like, oh, I'm really sacrificing. This somehow is, is burdensome to me. Probably not too grace-oriented if you think that. Um, this is a sacrifice of praise. So every time that we are thankful to God, that is a sacrifice of praise. So we saw the introduction. Uh, Deborah and Barak are the ones who sang on that day. And in the Deborah is the one who's referred to in the first person. I had a, 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 a student, uh, insightful, ask me after listening to a class on the Bible and the fact that it's authored by men, said, well, what about Judges 5? Judges is written by a male. Deborah may or may not have been the one who composed this, but it is certainly written from her perspective. And there's a lot of debate among scholars as to just whether or not Deborah is the one who wrote it, and that involves a lot of things, and, and usually it's liberals who are raising this issue because they doubt everything in the Scripture. So we're, uh, I think on the basis of, of Scripture that she, it's at least written for her, if not part, that she contributed to its writing. And it says that it's sung on that day. This was something that was prepared for this victorious celebration that came, according to Judges 4.23, not when uh, God subdued Yavin, the king of Canaan, because in verse 24 it goes on to say that the hand of the children of Israel continued to grow stronger and stronger. So they continued to fight against his forces and against his army until they reached that end game of his destruction. That's when this song is sung. You'd be amazed how many commentators don't even catch that. So the next section is a call to praise. In verses 2 and 3, when leaders lead in Israel is how the King, New King James translates it. When the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. So it is a call to praise God. And then it is a call to whom? To kings and princes. Well, wait a minute. That can't be to Israelites because there are, there's no Israelite king and there are no Israelite princes. So this is clearly addressing Gentile authority structures. Listen, O kings. Pay attention, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. So this first verse we translated... Uh, when the people willingly offer or when they volunteer themselves. We're going to see this same language when we get down into uh, somewhere around verse 13, 14. Uh, no, before that. 
uh, 11, 12, somewhere in that area. Oh, it's verse 9. Uh, same language, same language. So when the people volunteer, volunteer themselves, the people are stepping forward to do battle against the enemy, and they are trusting the Lord. That's why she says, praise the Lord, because it's not the leaders who lead. Remember I said last time, this is a funny little phrase in the Hebrew, and the words that are used here are the words um, para, meaning to uncover one's hair, one, uncover one's head, and a cognate of that word refers to the locks of hair, long hair of the head, and so it should be translated, I improved it a little bit from what I had last week, when the locks of hair are loosed in Israel. Well, why would you be loosing your hair? Because if you go to the Nazarite vow and you let your hair grow long, all, that's all part of it. So this is talking about they have volunteered themselves and taken a vow to the Lord in preparation uh, for the battle. <clears throat> and then she concludes with the command to... Uh, bless Yahweh, to praise Him, and to and what she means is let's rehearse the specifics of what God has done, and that's what this song does. And so we would translate it bless because the locks of hair were loosed in Israel because the people and I change this not on this slide because the people voluntarily offered themselves. Bless the Lord. Listen, O kings. Pay attention, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. And that I is defined later in verse 7 when we read, Until I, Deborah, arose. That brought us to the third section, verses 4 and 5, which is a rehearsal of of how God had delivered Israel in the past. And this is some, something a little cryptic to us. It just hits on a couple of high points. And it's referring to the, and we talked about this Sunday morning in Psalm 68, and this is one of those verses that's alluded to in Psalm 68, in the, uh, from about verse 11, 12, 13, that you picture Yahweh bringing his people together, entering into covenant with them on Mount Sinai, and then giving them the instructions for the tabernacle and constructing the Ark of the Covenant, which will be his the place where he dwells. Again and again in the Psalms you have the phrase, Yahweh, God who is enthroned between the cherubs. And you have the two cherubs on the Ark of the Covenant. And so that is the, the, the a physical location where the infinite God who cannot be contained in houses is locates himself to have a specific presence for Israel. And so there's the march, the victory march, coming up from the south, going around the Edomites, and we have this mention of water and the mountains gushing before Yahweh, and then a reference to Sinai. And I talked about what is the ear. And this is comes from the name of Seir the Horite, who inhabited this land of that was promised to Abraham, and it's his descendants that are described as the uh, as the ones who inhabited that land originally. Later the the descendants of Esau moved into that area, and the descendants of Esau uh, take on that, that real estate, and so Mount Seir is usually an allusion to the land of the Edomites. We saw passages that mention uh, Seir the Horite in the land before, uh, before the conquest in Genesis 36, 20, and 21, Genesis 14, 6, the Horites in the mountain of Seir, the sons of Seir in 1 Chronicles 1, 38. Deuteronomy reminds us that, um, or reminds the Israelites that by the time of the Exodus, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, typo there, Jacob's twin brother taken over that territory to the south and east of the Dead Sea, Deuteronomy 2.12 and Deuteronomy 2.22. Third, we saw that the Sinai is the location where God entered into covenant and began this uh, 
victorious march that started in 1447. 1446 is the Exodus. They spend a year at Mount Sinai. 1447, they began to move to Kadesh Barnea. Then they have to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Then they move around gradually. And then you have the time of the conquest from about 1406 to 1400. And then you have the post-conquest period until it starts with the time of the, ju of the judges. So at this point, we're probably 100 to 150 years after the, after the beginning of the conquest, which would put it somewhere around 1300 uh, B.C. So it is a march to victory, but it's a slow march to victory. What slowed it down? Sin, the disobedience of the people. Sometimes God wants to take us from point A to point B within a few years, and because we're sinful and self-centered, it takes most of our life. Psalm 68, 8 and 9 was what we looked at Sunday morning, and this describes the same thing. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel, you, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain whereby you confirmed your inheritance when it was weary. So there's a lot of similarity here with what's described in Judges 5. Not just here, but a couple of other verses refer back to the victory of Yael. And so we see that Psalm 68 recognizes and borrows from Judges 5. Now, why is that important? Because what you see in the Bible, this is called intertextuality. That means things that are in different texts and they connect together. For example, you have to do an intertextual study on the concept of the seed and the promise of the seed. And we start with Genesis 3.15 and the promise of the seed of the woman. And then we get to Abraham and the promise of the seed to Abraham. That's why we have all the genealogies is to trace all of this. And so you go through all of this, and the seed takes you all the way up to uh, Mary and Joseph in Matthew 1 and Luke 4. How many genealogy, genealogies do you have after that? None. Did you ever think about that? Because once Jesus comes, they don't need to keep the records anymore. So... All of this ties together, and intertextuality is when you see uh, Scripture in one place that's alluded to and developed in a slightly different way, some in another book, several, maybe several hundred years later, and it shows up here and there as you go through all of the Old Testament. And what does that tell us? That tells us that you can't just go in and pick this story and pick that story and pick that story and somehow... Uh, understand the Bible, that the Bible is interconnected and interdependent. If you start messing with one thing over here and say, well, maybe that's not historical, that's not in isolation. You look at what happens on Mount Sinai, and it's referenced again and again and again and again and again. And so if God did not physically appear and speak audibly to the Israelites as he did in Exodus uh, 19 and 20, then it, it's, you can't just cut those two chapters out and say, well, that's not right. Because every other place that Mount Sinai is mentioned is dependent upon that. And so you pull that out, you're going to hit n numerous places throughout the Old Testament and, and the New Testament that treat the appearance of God at Sinai in a literal historical fashion. And there's so many different things in the scripture that are that way. That's the, the, the essence of, of what Charlie came up with, Charlie Clough came up with, with his framework series is that he's facing a situation back in the 70s with a lot of uh, kids that have come out of good doctrinal churches who are going to Texas Tech, and they're getting slaughtered in the classroom because they hear all this stuff, all this liberal um, historical criticism from their professors, and they don't know how to answer any of it. And they want to know what the answers are. 
And so you have to understand how the, all of the Bible interconnects and is interdependent, and it reinforces each other. It's like the old illustration of the Greek soldiers who would lock shields. You know, all these books of the Bible are all locking shields together. All the stories, all the episodes, they're locking shields together because the Bible is a unified whole. And you can't just go in and start uh, pulling little pieces out here and there or the whole, whole thing collapses. And we have to understand that we really can trust the Bible. And that's why we're doing our series on Thursday night. Now, <clears throat> in this map... I'm simply showing the development here, there, all the way in the north. Up here, you have Hatsor up here, which is uh, Yavin's headquarters. Uh, down here, you have the Valley of Esdralon, the Jez also known as the Jezreel Valley, and that's where the battle is going to take place. But way down here is Seir, or Edom. South of there is Sinai. And so you have God leading the Israelites up, to the promised land. They'll go around the uh, Edomites and the uh, Ammonites and then cross over here. And the Canaanites still have a stronghold up in the north. And they are now being used by God to discipline Israel and put them under their domination and under their tyranny. And life has just become miserable in Israel. And so she goes on or whoever writes this, goes on to say uh, and describe these bad times and how God raised up Deborah. And in verse 6, we read, it's in the days of Shamgar. So this is reinforcing the historicity of that one verse at the end of chapter 4, talking about sh how God used Shamgar uh, to protect and deliver uh, Israel from, from the Philistines in that one instant. And that this ties it, this little chronological note, that it's in the days of Yael. It's in this same time frame, so this isn't uh, out of chronological order. And it describing how bad the times are. The highways are deserted, the travelers walked along the byways, and then we have some really tough things to translate in verse 7 and verse 8. And what we noticed last time, I pointed out, is that this word deserted and the tra translated as deserted in verse 6 and as ceased in verse 7 is the Hebrew word hadal. And this has to do with something that ceases, something that's abandoned, something that is uh, uh, d deserted now. And why is it this way? Because as we go back, let me go back here a couple to this point, this map shows all these major trade routes. These are caravan routes. They come up, the green and the purple line come up from the southwest, which is Egypt. And so this is a major highway for bringing supplies and trade goods and everything. And it can either go along the way of the sea or it c cuts across here over to the, um, to the west of Megiddo. And you have a major... Uh, junction there at Megiddo, and that's why that, that city is there. Something like 32 different layers of civilization at Megiddo. It's been there a long time. It's, it's not as old as Jericho, but it probably almost. It was a fortified city to guard these trade routes. And you have the same thing up here at Hatzor. It's right on the junction of where the trade route would go north, uh, in one direction, up to it, toward Lebanon, or it would go to the northeast toward Damascus. So this is this junction. This is economically significant. This was the, their commercial lifeline. This is as important as the port of Los Angeles. You shut it down, you're not going to get any goods. You're going to have a supply chain problem. So all because of what? Sin. You can make your own application from that today. So you have all of these areas that are going on here. So when we translate it, we understand that, that there, it's horrible. There's, you, the, the caravans have to take the back roads because there's crime, increased criminality. I had a shootout at 6.30 in the morning at the end of my street about a month ago. Last night, I heard that somewhere around 6 or 6.30 that some guys went in to 
um, to rob the CVS on the corner of Gessner and I-10. And there have been numerous other things that have happened just, just between my house and the church. That never happened before. But that happens because of the elected officials that w a lot of people have allowed to be elected in this city because they don't know any better. And so now we have crime that is just extremely out of control. And when they do arrest somebody, if they don't have any past, past history, if they've never been arrested before, they let them go. And then they can arrest them five more times, and each time they let them go because they don't have any record. And so they just continue to uh, let the crime increase. That's a sign of God's discipline. We're not being disciplined because we let that happen. The fact that that happens is God's discipline for letting apostate people run the city and the nation. So we have to be uh, aware of that, and that's, it's describing the same kind of thing here. And so it, it talks about this word for village. It's not really that. We'll look at that in a minute. And then at the end it says, until I, Deborah, arose. And this is that uh, Hebrew word kum. And we talked about this on Sunday in relation to Psalm 68. It frequently refers to God rising up to take on the enemies of Israel. And we see that in passages like Psalm 7, verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you've commanded. Psalm 9, 19. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Psalm 12, 5. God says, now I will arise. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. Psalm 17, 3, arise, O Lord, calling upon God to rise up. Now we deal with, briefly, just to remind you of the problem here, village life ceased. But the NET translates it, warriors were scarce. That's a difficult problem in, in the Hebrew. And because the word that is translated as village and, and, and one in translated as warriors in another is a word that is only used a couple of times. It happens to be used again down in Judges 5.11 in the same context where it's clear that it's talking about archers. So it, it, the, the issue here, when you look it up, and this is one reason I thank God we have computers and Logos Bible software because I've got every, I always get every dictionary, every encyclopedia I can get my hands on, especially the lexicons and the latest four volume dictionary of classical Hebrew uh, gives four different meanings for this word. They think there were four different words. They're all spelled the same. But they, and they sound the same, but they had four distinct meanings. So you really have to look at, at context, and it it's just drives translators nuts trying to figure out some of these things. So I think that, that there, it's <clears throat> related to the warriors. Warriors were scarce. What are they talking about? They're scarce in Israel until you arose, Deborah. The Israelites aren't fighting. They don't have a militia. They don't have a Haganah. They don't have an IDF. Uh, they don't have any of the underground uh, uh, militias that they had back in the days of the uh, British Mandate. They don't have anything like that going on to protect the people. And they're just being taken advantage of and uh, scared by, and um, terrorized by the Canaanites. So it should be translated, warriors were scarce. They were scarce in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. And that is such a shift. This is, this is where the mood of the psalm shifts. We've been talking about how bad it is until, and that always indicates a, a specific point in time where there's a shift. Something either ends or it changes, and in this case, it, it ends because things are going to change because Deborah uh, comes along, and she is called a mother in Israel, which is probably a reference to the fact that a mother is one who nurtures and protects, and in her role as a prophetess, as a spokesperson for God, she is the one who is giving the words of comfort. God's words are always comforting, even if you don't like them. 
they should be comforting. Verse 8 is also difficult to translate. The verb that is used there for chose is not a third person plural in the Hebrew. It is a third person singular. It's very clear. But some people, some scholars looked at it and said, well, that didn't really make sense because when they looked at that last word in the line, choosing new gods, Elohim, they're thinking, well, this should be talking about the Jews are choosing these alternative gods, the Baals and the Asherah. But you have to stick with what the grammar says if you believe in a literal uh, historical inerrant scripture, that every syllable is inspired by God. And so there's a reason it's second person singular. Don't try to figure it out. He refers to God. And the term Elohim, as we have seen, even though it is, stands for the generic meaning of God, it also refers to uh, fallen angels. It refers to the whole council of the angelic host. And it also refers to those who are, have delegated authority from God and so who function as his representative as civil leaders. So they were also called Elohim. So it makes much more sense in the context that he, that is Yahweh, after he raises up Deborah, that he chose new leaders for the people, among whom was Barak. Then, which indicates a time, that's an important time word. First, Deborah arises. Second, uh, he chooses new leaders. Third, then there's war uh, in the gates. Now, the Jews are probably living in unwalled villages. And so the, the war is talking about the gates. The gates is standing for the cities of the Canaanites, and there's war coming from the Canaanites. But not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. They have, been, they have been disarmed. And we know this later at the time of the Philistines. The Philistines had iron, and they refused to allow the Israelites to have blacksmiths so that they couldn't work with iron. So that limited their arsenal. And they're fighting iron weapons with bronze weapons. And that's not very good. So disarmament has always been the tool of the tyrant. Whether they're trying to take away your Second Amendment rights or whether they're trying to disarm in terms of national security, it's always the tool for someone who wants to tyrannize somebody and prohibit them from being able to defend themselves either personally or nationally. So that word then is very important. And um, I've retranslated this as he, that is God, chose new leaders. Then war was in the gates, and not a shield or spear was seen among the 40,000 in Israel. That takes us to uh, verses 9 through 11c. So at this point, we are clearly in new territory that we didn't get to at all uh, last time. So it's at this point that uh, we see the call to praise God for his uh, righteous acts. And it's also a warning to the people. Again, we get into some difficulties. Uh, who's speaking here? It appears to be Deborah. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly. See, this goes back, uses the same language you had back in verse 2. Who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Remember the last time it's used, it also ends with a command to bless the Lord, to call upon praise for what God has done. And then there is this this somewhat cryptic statements in verses 10 and 11. Speak, you who ride on white donkeys. Is there a problem with white donkeys? See, you have to understand the culture. You who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire. How many of y'all have seen a donkey up close? Anybody ridden a donkey? Ridden a bur I tried to break one one time and almost smashed my head into a tree. Um, 
they're gray. They're gray, dark gray. This is something special for it to be light colored. Some suggest the meaning should be tawny. Some say it's just a, a, a light color, um, maybe not white, but very light. And this would be special. So, so whoever's writing on this is somebody who would have money. They would be somewhat wealthy. Uh, those who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, it's not quite that in the Hebrew at all. Uh, we'll look at that in a sec. And who walk along the road. But who are these people? Are they Jews or are they Gentiles? The last time we had a group mentioned uh, was back in the verse 3. Remember verse 10 follows verse 9. Verse 9 is parallel to verse 2. So when verse 3 addresses the hero kings, we give hero princes, that's talking about Gentile leaders, that here it's more than likely talking about the Gentile merchants that are on these caravan routes. You can't be dogmatic about that. It could be Jews. There's a lot of different opinions stated on, on that. Um, Far from the noise of the archers among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Then I put the last line down at the bottom because that's really the topical sentence for the next section. So probably Deborah is saying, my heart is with the rulers of Israel. And the word for heart is lev, and this is often used as the seat of thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So a heart is often the seat of thought. It is rarely used of emotion. It is primarily used as the seat of one's thinking. It is talking about how she thinks. We have a similar phrase. Liberals don't like it when we say our thoughts and prayers are with somebody who's gone through a tragedy. Have you noticed how many times Jen Saki is faced with some crisis like what just happened up in Kenosha? And was that where it was? Where they had the, the guy drove through the parade? Waukesha, that's right, Waukesha. And apparently the president's going to be in the neighborhood, but he's not going to go there. And she said, but we're really sorry. Our thoughts are with them. Well, if anybody that was conservative under the Trump administration said that, they said, oh, yeah, that's all you always say. You really don't want to do anything. You just say those things. So Deborah says that she's thinking about the rulers, the leaders of Israel now who offered themselves willingly with the people. She's, she's thankful for them because they have volunteered themselves. And so the word there translated ruler is just another really strange word. It is the Hebrew word chachak, and it literally means to inscribe or decree. That's what the first primary meaning is, and it talks about carving out letters. But in one form of the word, it, has, it, means a, um, it means a statute or an ordinance or a law. And so it is thought that it has the idea here of a leader, one who is decreeing things. Uh, so she says that her thinking is with the rulers of Israel. And... She then says, with the volunteers of the people, same words, nada for, I'm translated here as volunteer, and barak, meaning a command to, to bless the Lord, as we have back in 5.2. So she's, that's how she is thinking about them, is that they are going into battle. These are these wonderful people who have volunteered to go into the army and to go fight against the Canaanites, and they're outnumbered, and they ha the Canaanites have greater technology. Uh, it's real tough when you've got 900 chariots going against just foot soldiers, and the foot soldiers don't have any weapons. So she is thinking about them, which means she is praying about them, and she's explaining that in this particular song. <clears throat> so when you comes to the next line where it says, speak you who ride, I've retranslated this here, on light-colored female donkeys. These were the best donkeys. It, it indicates a person of status, a person of significance. 
and he has luxurious blankets that indicate he has some position. It, it, it's, it's not talking about um, you know, the robes of a judge. It's talking about someone who has an important and significant position. And then, and what he probably indicates is first she warns the kings of the Canaanites, you, you Gentile kings, you pay attention to what God's going to do here. And now she's calling out uh, these, these uh, tr uh, traders, not traitors, traders, these commercial uh, men, who, men of business who are taking advantage. They're Canaanites probably, and they're taking advantage of the Israelites. And so she's calling, calling them out. And uh, in both verse 2, or 3 rather, where it talks about, listen, O kings, pay attention, O princes, and here there's a tone of scorn and derision to them. They're the enemy. And so she's telling them that you've been relying on your own success and your own resources and your own money, and now God is going to take care of you. That's the subtext. All right. Got another little problem here. There. Okay. So verse 11. Again, a verse that is difficult to translate. Far from the noise of the archers among the watering places. And so this, what does it mean, the noise of the, of the archers? And this is talking about the excited conversations at the watering places. Now, we all talk about the local watering hole, and usually somebody has in mind the local bar. And what goes on in the local bar? Everybody gets together, and they talk about politics, and they talk about this, and they talk about that. And they second-guess all the football games from the previous weekend and Monday morning and Tuesday night quarterback, all of the other things. And in these small villages and small towns, there would be one major well. And so everybody would go there to get their water. They would sit around and they would talk and share the local gossip, talk about what was going on. So this is talking about the, the people who are coming together with some of those who were uh, in, the, in the fight, talking excitedly about uh, the victory and what was going on. And, and that's further explained in the next line there, that is at these watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord. See, that's where they are praising God. That's what declarative praise is. It's declaring what God has done. They're talking about all the things that happened in the battle and how God uh, destroyed the enemy. And then it says, these are the righteous acts for his, his villagers, and it's the term there, as we saw earlier, is probably related to warriors. It's the same word that's used in that earlier verse, uh, for his warriors in Israel. So the people, guys are coming back from the battle, and they're just telling everybody about this miraculous deliverance. And uh, then we have the, another chronological marker, and, and it says, then... The people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. And the gates were where the city fathers would, would talk. Now we're going to rehearse what happens. That's, that line really talks about what happens next. That's why it goes with what's coming. It's not concluding the other. I misspoke a second ago. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Because going down to the gates pictures the war, the fight. The gates, the walled cities, are the Canaanite cities. Now, what we're going to see here is a response to the call. And the initial call comes from God to Deborah. This is a, her call to be a prophetess and a judge. Awake, awake, Deborah. See, the command to Christians is not to be woke which is a Marxist term, just substitute Marxism every time you see woke, but to be awake. Remember last year at the pastor's conference, uh, Pastor Clay Ward gave a great paper, and it's, I think the title was Awake But Not Woke. And that's what this is. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. A song of victory because of what God has done. Arise, Barak. 
and lead your captives away. Now, who are the captives? This isn't talking about the captives they took from the Canaanites. This is talking about the Israelites that he's going to lead in the battle who were captives basically under the, the heel of of uh, Yavin, the uh, Canaanite king from Hatzor. And so uh, this is such an important word, identifying, uh, identifying captives. So he is to, to be, this is his call, he is to rise up. As we looked at that word earlier, that's that word kum. It's that word that's used at the beginning of Psalm 68. Rise up, O Lord. And in all of those other verses I cited earlier, calling upon God to rise up and deal with the problem. So he is calling on Barak to rise up, because remember he really didn't want to go into battle because unless Deborah went with him. So this is his call to get it in gear. Then verse 13 says, Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. That is a really difficult Hebrew se section to, uh, to deal with. And the, it talks about the, those who survived at first. Uh, and I think it should be translated here, then came down a remnant of the nobles of the people. These are those who came, came down. And then there's an expansion in the second line. Uh, and uh, as the writer is saying, and probably Deborah, the Lord came down for me as warriors. And that's probably the best way to understand this as we uh, see... Uh, it's similar to that in verse 13. The mighty really is referring to warriors. So she is talking about how God came down uh, to, provide, uh, to provide victory. And so this tells us, it summarizes the response of Israel at the time of the call to war to go against the Canaanite. And... Then we come to the next section, verses 14 through 15, which is really just dealing with the response of different tribes. And you would think that there would be a unified response against a common en enemy, but no. Because what happens in moral relativism is everyone is their own god. And everyone wants to do what they think is right. And so it, uh, you, when you get into a relativistic culture, like we have under postmodernism, and everybody does what's right in his own eyes, there's no unity in a nation anymore. There's nothing cohesive. There's nothing to hold us together. And really, the only thing that bound us together for the first 150 years was the Bible and a belief in the creator God of the Bible and the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But starting in the mid-19th century, that... Uh, the erosion had begun a little bit before that, but it really was clear by the time of the war between the states, not because of the slavery issue, but because by then you have, you already have leaking into this country the liberal uh, theological ideas of higher criticism combined with a naturalistic explanation of creation coming from the historical geologists and coming from uh, from Darwin. You have the rise of people like uh, Herbert Spencer and Augusta Comte, and they're, they're the fathers of sociology. And uh, it's during that same period in the mid-19th century, you have uh, Karl Marx coming along with his Marxist uh, interpretation, uh, just a misapplication of a, just a bastardized combination of Hegelian thought and and uh, a little bit of Christianity uh, in terms of a linear view of history. And then you have Sigmund Freud coming along telling everybody that it's not sin. Remember, you just came along, you were a cosmic accident caused by an electric, electrical charge hitting a pool of, of, uh, of goo, and you're just an accident. So the big, all these things that you've always heard, he hated Christianity. All these things you've heard about sin just aren't true. That's just a psychological problem. So all of those things were designed to just tear apart a Judeo-Christian worldview. 
and and it's done its job. It's taken 150 years, but look at how we are. We're just an absolute mess. And the only thing we can do is to keep our eyes on the solution. I keep thinking, I have friends who are pastors who love every conspiracy theory that comes along, and every Monday morning I you know, get all this stuff in email that I don't pay attention to, and I said, the problem with it, it's nice to know what's going on, but don't pay too much attention to it, because when Peter put his eyes on the waves, he started to sink. What we need to do is put our eyes on the Lord and focus on just what our responsibilities are and what we're supposed to do and trust the Lord and don't get caught up with all the wave action that Satan's throwing at us because all that's going to do is wipe us out. Just focus on what you're supposed to do and leave the battle to the Lord. Let him take care of things. So Israel is just a, a mess, and that's what described here in this list of the tribes and how they responded to the call for battle. You have Ephraim mentioned at the beginning. It's from Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. Now, I don't know what that means, neither does anybody else, unless somehow the Amalekites had gotten a foothold into um, into the hill country in some degree, because Ephraim usually describes that central area of Samaria. And um, after you, Benjamin, with your peoples, from Makir, now that's another term that is rather uh, difficult uh, to understand, and uh, the, term, uh, the term Makir uh, goes back as, a alternate, as an alternate name for one of Manasseh's sons, as he's listed in Genesis 50, verse 23. And he's the father of Gilead, Gilad. And uh, so Numbers 32, 39 to 40 reports that Machir captured the land of Gilead and that Moses assigned that land to him. So this is talking about uh, that group coming from across the Jordan. You have... Um, and from Zebulon, they're in this same general uh, northern part of Israel, east of the Sea of Ga or west of the Sea of Galilee. From Zebulon, those who bear the recruiter staff, see they're gaining volunteers. You have the princes of Issachar who are with with Deborah. So you have these these are the uh, the good guys. And in verses 14 and the first part of 15, these are the ones who. Uh, were following Deborah and generally pulled it together. And then after that, you have those who are divided against it in the last part of the verse among the divisions of Reuben. Uh, there were great resolves of heart. What that means is there's a lot of debating. Should we go? Should we not go? Are we going to uh, help out or not help out? They're divided. That's what that first part means, the, the divided, the, the, the divisiveness of, of Reuben. And, uh, and then the rhetorical questions, why did you sit among the sheepfolds? You didn't come out to the battle. You stayed home, took care of your sheep. Uh, to hear the pipings of the flocks, the divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Oh, should we really go? Maybe there's a problem. Maybe this isn't a moral war. Maybe somehow this isn't a just war. Let's just let somebody else handle it. Verse, um, and then uh, in verses uh, 16 and 17, this is all talking about those who were negative. Gilad stayed behind the, beyond the Jordan. Uh, why did Dan remain on ships? Didn't come to the battle. Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Uh, but then you have those who really came through. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. And then the narrative describing the supernatural, the invisible side of the war in verses 19 to 23. Um, the kings came, they fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh. This is about five miles south of Megiddo, and by the waters of Megiddo. Now, the Megiddo is not on the river Kishon. That runs through the middle and then kind of goes off to the uh, north and east in the uh, Jezreel Valley. I'll show you the map in a minute. Um, so just talking about Megiddo, and those kings fought, but they didn't get any plunder. They didn't get any spoil to take home. 
Uh, and then we're told what happens in the heavens. From the heavens, the stars fought. The stars is usually are often used as a metaphor for the angels. The angels fought. From their paths, they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. So God is, uses a flash flood to wipe out the chariot corps and the army of Sisera. And it's not up to the people who don't have any weapons. It's not up to the Jews. They just happen to be there to watch it. And that's often what it is for us. We're just there to watch God provide the deliverance. But you don't want to get involved in trying to make it happen yourself. And then in verses 22 and 23, then the hooves pounded. This is the, the heart of the battle, the galloping, the galloping of steeds. And then all of a sudden we see the angel of the Lord. Now we didn't see the angel of the Lord anywhere in, in Judges 4. But now the angel of the Lord who is overseeing the battle, and that's the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, he says, curse Meraz. Now we don't know anything about Meraz, but apparently it was a town or village uh, in the area that did not come to the aid of the Israelites. Curse its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, uh, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So here's our map. Here's Megiddo here, the, that major uh, trade route junction, highway junction. Down here is Tanakh, five miles south of Megiddo. Over here is the Sea of Galilee. Over here in this area is uh, Nazareth. So this is right in the heart of a lot of action in the Old Testament. You have Mount Tabor where the uh, troops under Barak come down into the battle. Uh, just south of there is Endor where Saul goes to see the witch of Endor. Just south of there is this mountain of Moreh, which is where uh, Gideon will thin out to his 300. Um, the, 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 the springs are there where he thins things out. So all of this is happening here. And somewhere in this area was Meraz, which got, was cursed by God. Have we found it? No. Does anybody know where it is? No. God wiped them out. And then there's praise for Yael. Because of her courage, she's not an Israelite, remember. She's a Kenite. And she is going to... Uh, come to the aid of Israel. She is a friend of Israel. Most blessed among women is Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Blessed is she among women in tents. Does that remind you of anybody? That's what's said of Mary. Blessed is she among women. This is high praise from God. Talks about um, Sisera. He asked for water and she gave milk. She brought out curds in a bowl fit for a king. She stretched her left hand out to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. Now, it doesn't say left hand. It just says hand in the text. But if she's grabbing the hammer with her right hand, what's she going to grab the tent peg with? Her left hand. So it makes it more precise. It's obvious. She pounded Sisera, pierced his head. It's staccato in the Hebrew. It just boom, 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 boom. Uh, fast action pounded Sisera, pierced his head, split and struck through his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell limp, he lay lifeless. At her feet he sank, he collapsed. Where he sank, there he fell dead. And she's praised for that. And then the scene shifts, and we're looking at the mother of Sisera, who's home, waiting for him to come, looking longingly out the window, waiting to hear his chariot coming, waiting to get word. And um, she cries out, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest ladies answered her. Yes, she answered herself. She knew what happened. They said, are they not finding and dividing the spoil to every man, a girl or two? For Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery. Um, where are we? In verse 30, for the... Uh, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. But there's nothing. And then we have a concluding wish. 
or a desire expressed that God would do like this to all of his enemies. Thus may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him, those who love God, be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. Now, after it's been cold or after it's been rainy or after we've had a hurricane, the sky clears like we've had the last couple of days and the sun comes out, it's just glorious. It just makes you feel better all over. And that's how people should be when they're around us. We should, uh, are, are, should be like the sun. Those who love the Lord should be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. And thus it concludes. The last word is, so the land had rest. For 40 years. So this is just a great, tremendous insight into how battles take place in the physical world, and they're related to that which is going on in the invisible world. And next time, what I want to do is look at some issues that are raised by this, issues that are germane to what's going on today, uh, issues related to God's plan and purposes for the different sexes, for men and women, and what about gender confusion, and all these other issues that come up, because that sort of bubbles to the surface here when you've got a woman that God chooses, uh, unique among women, and then you have a man who's not quite with it, and the most of the men aren't with it. They're not really willing to come to the call of the trumpet. So what is this all about? So we'll take care of that, look at that after I get back from pre-trib next week. Father, thank you for this time that we can look at this uh, tremendous song, this tremendous hymn of victory, praising you, and may we be reminded that the battle is always yours. The battle is always the Lord's, and we have to do what Scripture tells us to do, Pray, read through scripture, confess sin, uh, do our responsibilities as fathers, as husbands, as mothers, as wives, as children, as students, as workers, as employees and employers. Fulfill our day-to-day responsibilities looking to you to grant us the strength and the wisdom to live our lives before you and let you take care of all of the storms of life that swirl around us that we can be relaxed and calm and that we can shine forth like the sun and be a source of comfort to those around us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.